Let's Talk About Mitts Baby is sponsored by Signature Hardware. If you're looking for that perfect item to take your kitchen, bathroom, or just your house up a notch, head over to SignatureHardware.com. They have honestly some of the most beautiful housewares I've ever seen. The vanities? Oh my god vanities. Who knew they could be so absolutely stunning? And I am a big bathtub person. So yes, I've just longingly scrolled through all of their bathtub options because why not? They've got beautiful bathroom furnishings and kitchen furnishings. You could get an incredible rain shower or this a beautiful farmhouse sink or maybe just a beautiful one of those things that hangs over your bathtubs. So you can have a glass of wine. I've actually picked out eight different furnishings that really stood out to me on Signature Hardware. They're my style. I just love them. They're absolutely just goals. See for yourself at SignatureHardware.com slash myths. You will be amazed at the variety and the quality. Oh, hi, hello. Welcome to another thrilling episode of Let's Talk About Myths, baby. As always, I'm your host, Liv, a crazy person and lover of mythology. Well, nerds, today I've just got a quick announcement before I jump into the story. Now, if you're not from the city of Toronto or its surrounding regions, you can straight up just ignore me right now. But if you are from Toronto, listen up. I will be visiting there later in September. I used to live there. Love it. Miss it deeply. And while I'm there, I thought I'd throw a little test live event for all of you Torontonians, because there are far more of you listeners there than in the town that I live in. So, on September 21st, that's a Saturday, you can join me in Trinity Bellwoods Park, exact locale TBD, to talk mythology, to ask questions, to chat about whatever we want. It's going to be a fairly small group, really open and casual, so it'll be a nice way to connect with me and with the other mythological lovers in the town, and hopefully just learn a bunch of shit. So please head over to the Facebook page, facebook.com slash mythsbaby, and RSVP to the event there. It has all the details, and it'll have the updated location within the park on the day. And finally, it will give me an idea as to who's coming, which I could really use. I hope I get to see you there, you wonderful nerds. And now, on to the good stuff. Mini-Myth, the most murderous women of mythology, the Danaids. Belus is a king in Libya, and he has three sons. The two we're concerned with, though, are twins, named Danaeus and Aegyptus. Aegyptus is given a kingdom, and he names it after himself. Yes, it's an easy guess there. Aegyptus names his kingdom Egypt. Of course, I must point out here that this part is very much mythical, because the Egyptians were around long, long before the Greeks who would have actually written down this myth. In any event, Aegyptus rules Egypt, and he has 50 sons. Yes, 50. Impressive, I know. These sons, of course, had many different mothers, because women were still women in mythology. Meanwhile, Danaeus, his brother, would rule Libya. He, too, had 50 children, though daughters. Now, is this a commentary by the Greeks on the lives of the people in Africa? Possibly, but if it is, it isn't a nice one, and I'm certain it is also very inaccurate as to how people actually lived. I say again, the Egyptians were around long before the Greeks. They're badass. When their father, Belus, dies, the twins fight over their respective inheritances. They both appear to be kings in their own right, but I'm sure Belus had a lot of treasure, palaces and the like, much to fight over. I might add, the twins do not seem to have had the best of relationships. Olsen's, they are not. They were wary of each other and how the other might trick them. So when Aegyptus proposes a conciliatory mass marriage between his 50 sons and Danaeus's 50 daughters, Danaeus is concerned about what Aegyptus might mean by doing this. The fact that they're 50 first cousins doesn't seem to be a concern. You all know how much the ancient Greeks liked marrying within the family. Cousins might as well be complete strangers. It's not like they're siblings like the gods. So Danaeus is concerned. His brother has proposed this mass marriage, but does he have something up his sleeve? His are the sons, so certainly the marriages would benefit them more than Danaeus's daughters. 
Surely Egyptus is just planning something with this proposal, and it can't be good. Danaeus is so concerned with what Egyptus might be planning that he seeks Athena's help in fleeing Libya with his daughters. He wants to bring them to Greece, far away from his suspicious brother and his fifty suspicious nephews. Danaeus and his daughters set sail for Greece, and they stop on the island of Rhodes along the way. There they dedicate to Athena, as is appropriate. From Rhodes they sail again. When they next reach land, they're finally in Greece. They land on the Peloponnesian Peninsula in Lerna. There, Danaeus announces that he's been chosen by the gods to become the king of Argos. The ancient Greeks may do some crazy things in their mythology, but arriving on a strange land you've never been to before when you've come from a different continent and culture entirely and announcing you're meant to be the king of that city that already has a king is simply not acceptable. The king of Argos, Gelenor, just laughs at Danaeus. I mean, it's pretty fucking absurd. The people of Argos come together to discuss this claim. Danaeus is telling everyone that it's Athena herself who's determined him to be the rightful king. But they couldn't make up their minds in one night, and so they put it off. The people of Argos decide it's too late. They all want to go to sleep. They'll come back in the morning and finalize who they determined to be their rightful king. But that was all it took. Overnight, a wolf comes down from the mountains and attacks a herd of cattle. The wolf takes out many of the cows, and he kills the bull. Those damn omens. The people of Argo see what's happened, and oh, what a travesty! They see this as an obvious omen. Why else would it have happened on that very night? They read in this omen that if Danaeus is refused the throne of Argos, he'll take it by force, bringing a whole slew of violence to Argos that they really didn't need. No, they think, the only solution is to give the kingship to Danaeus and avoid the death and destruction that would come if they refuse him. They use this omen to convince the current king that he should just resign and give his throne to Danaeus. And it goes well! For a long time, Danaeus is a great and powerful ruler. He's sure that it's the wolf that gave him the throne in the first place, and that it was sent by Apollo, so he dedicates a shrine to him. He becomes such a powerful leader that the people of the entire region begin referring to themselves as Danaeans, something that lasts for an age. He is, by all accounts, a great ruler with an impeccable legacy. Obviously this couldn't last, though. There's a reason I'm telling you all this story, and it isn't because Danaeus was just an awesome leader in Greece and we all remember him for being a good and chill dude. No, then why would I have told you about his brother, Egyptus, and those 50 sons? For a long time, things were good, but eventually the region of Argos becomes plagued with a drought. They say that Poseidon is angry. The region had been determined to belong to Hera, and by God, couldn't Poseidon catch a break? He couldn't have Athens, that was Athena's, and now Argos is Hera's? Ugh. So Poseidon gives the region a drought. They are in desperate need of water. At this Danaeus sends his fifty daughters in search of water. He tells them they must find some, and they must make Poseidon happy by any means necessary. Sex, probably. So the women go in search of water, and one of them, Amimini, ends up disturbing a satyr in her search. The satyr, angry at being woken up so rudely, tries to rape Amimini, because that's the world of Greek mythology. Rape is the answer to everything. Amimini runs from the satyr and calls out to Poseidon, asking for his help. He comes to her aid, gee, I wonder why, and he throws his trident at the satyr. He misses the satyr, who dodges the trident with ease, and so Poseidon has sex with Amimini. No, there's nothing to explain how he gets from throwing a trident at a satyr to having sex with her. Again, this is Greek mythology. And is it consensual? I mean, unclear? But given she's been sent with orders to make him happy, I'm going to assume it's at the very least coerced? Regardless, Amimini makes Poseidon happy, just as she was sent to. When she tells him why she was sent, he's more than happy to help. 
He tells her to pull his trident from the rock, where it had lodged in place of the satyr, and when she does, three strong streams of water erupt from the rock. This stream they call a mimini. But still, our story of Danaeus and his daughters is not over yet. Again, I'll remind you of Aegyptus. This is where he finally comes back into play. Though it's been years and years since Danaeus fled with his daughters, Aegyptus hasn't gotten over the slight. He's still hell-bent on having his fifty sons marry their fifty cousins, and he'll do whatever he needs to to make that happen. Aegyptus sends his sons in search of Danaeus and his daughters, and they find him without issue. When the sons arrive, they beg Danaeus to change his mind, to allow them to marry his daughters. And, we're told, they have every intention of murdering the daughters on the wedding night. Aegyptus has instilled in his sons the very toxic idea that rejection warrants a punishment as horrific as murder. Such a foreign concept in our current world. Danaeus, though, isn't an idiot. He's been suspicious of his brother from the start, and he isn't about to change his mind now. He turns Aegyptus' sons down, rejecting their offer once more. Without hesitation, Aegyptus' sons lay siege on Argos. Danaeus and his daughters, along with everyone else living within the city walls, are trapped. And though Amimini has helped the city get a spring, it doesn't reach the city walls. They're without water. Before long, Danaeus is forced to submit to Aegyptus' sons, promising whatever they want so long as they'll free the city and allow his people to reach the spring. Of course, as expected, what Aegyptus' sons want is the mass marriage that their father had proposed those many years ago. Was the murder of Danaeus' daughters the intention from the start? It's hard to say. Perhaps it was Aegyptus' plan all along so that they might get whatever Danaeus was given after the death of their father, or maybe it became a plan of murder when they rejected the plan and fled Libya entirely. In any event, it's the plan now. The mass marriage is arranged, and Danaeus goes through the cousins, assigning them to each other. It's just so fucking romantic, you guys. I mean, who's adapting this into a rom-com because I need it? Danaeus assigns each of his daughters to one of their cousins. Sometimes he assigns them because their mothers were of similar rank in society. Or, even better, sometimes he assigns them to one another because they have similar names. Like his daughter Clytie is going to marry Clytus, and Stenely will marry Stenelus, and Chrysippe will marry Chrysippus. What happy marriages they will have, and they will definitely not be confused, like, all the time. Oh, and for the rest of the daughters and their cousins, he just pulls names from a helmet, like a secret Santa. And so, the wedding night is upon this very large family about to intermarry on a massive scale. But, Danaeus is prepared. Before the wedding celebration, he provides each of his daughters with sharp pins for them to put in their hair. At midnight, after the feasting and marrying has been done, at the height of their wedding nights. Danaeus' daughters, the Danaids, each pull their long, sharp pins from their hair and one by one they stab their newlywed husbands in the heart while they lie in their beds. Only one of Aegyptus' sons survives, Lynceus, is saved by his wife-to-be, Hypermnestra. She's advised to do so by Hera. He hadn't raped her on his wedding night, so he was to be spared. She helps him escape, but in the end she's caught for this and tried by her father. The people of Argos, though, side with her, and she's acquitted. The heads of Aegyptus' murdered sons are buried at Lerna, while the bodies are given the necessary funereal rites in Argos. Athena and Hermes purify the daughters, the Danaids, for what they've done. They were, after all, going to be murdered themselves if they'd not done away with their new husbands first. And in the end, they eventually remarry, though it takes a few tries as the first of the new husbands are treated as guinea pigs of sorts. When they aren't murdered on their wedding nights, more men arrive to marry the rest of the women. But in the end, the judges of the underworld still determine that they're to be punished. The Danaids now walk the underworld carrying jugs of water filled with holes. The water pours from the jugs as they walk, 
and they're forced to refill and keep walking over and over for eternity. Oh, nerds, thank you all for listening to this not-quite-so-mini-myth. There are so few stories in Greek mythology with endings like these, where the women straight up win. Sure, they're murderers, but the men were prepared to be murderers too, so who's really in the wrong here? This is the story of the Danaids. It's called that for a reason. These women remain famous for what they did, righteous or not. I'd also like to just let you know that one of my sources for this, Apollodorus, names every single one of the sons and the daughters. It's a lot. Like, far, far too much. Anyway, I just like the adorable matching names, so I gave you those ones. Now, I know many of you may have been expecting a mini-myth on the next Zodiac constellation, Virgo. Or maybe I even mentioned that was coming? All very possible. Regardless, today's episode was not about Virgo, as you can clearly see. This is because both Virgo and the last constellation I have to cover, Libra, are minimal. They have almost no stories, I'm sorry. So I'll be covering them both together in a mini-myth a little later, closer to when we're in the period of Libra. You're all the best. As usual, if you could rate, review, subscribe on iTunes, it's always immensely helpful. I know many of you have logged onto iTunes just to provide me with a review, even if you don't listen on that platform, and to you, I give a huge thank you. Anyway, I won't keep you any longer. Thank you again. If you're in around Toronto, I hope to see you soon. I'm Liv, and oh how I love this shit.